Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Experian Quarterly Business Credit Review for Q2 2017. I'm Gary Stockton, and before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to remind you to take the opportunity today to engage our experts using the question and answer box in the WebEx applet. We'll try and answer as many of your questions as possible throughout or at the end. If you are encountering any technical issues with sound or anything like that, if you can visit help.webex.com. And during today's webinar, we'll be discussing key findings in the most recent Experian Moody's Analytics Main Street report for Q2 2017. We will be sharing a link to the download uh, for the slides at the end of today's presentation. At the conclusion of our talk, we'll also share an email with you later today with that. Our speakers today will be Gavin Harding of Experian, Derek G. McCrank from Moody's Analytics, and Christian Derivis. With more than 20 years' experience in banking and finance, Gavin Harding brings a deep understanding of both the issues facing clients and the practical challenges involved in implementing solutions. Mr. Harding has worked closely with many of experienced clients, helping them manage risk, improve efficiency, and achieve sustainable growth. Derek Grunfelder McCrank is an associate economist at Moody's Analytics and a member of the Credit Analytics Group in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Derek works on building stress testing models of consumer loan performance for a number of consulting projects. He has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Chris DeRidis is a senior director at Moody's Analytics where he manages a team of economists focused on the consumer credit modeling and analysis for banks, investors, utilities, and other financial institutions. He provides regular commentary to clients and the media on the state of consumer credit and small business. He received a PhD and master's in economics from Johns Hopkins University for his work on income inequality and technological change. Chris graduated from the Honors College at Michigan State University with a bachelor's degree in economics. And now I'd like to turn things over to Chris Derridis from Moody's to kick off today's program. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Gary, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, to the call. Uh, very happy to have you all on this uh, quarterly update on uh, small business uh, credit trends. Uh, today what I'd like to do is kick us off uh, with an overview of economic trends, uh, particularly those trends that are impacting small business. I'll discuss some of our uh, outlook, a little bit of forecast in terms of where these trends may be headed, as well as some of the risks, and in particular, some of the economic risks that, again, could impact small businesses and small business credit. Then I'll turn it over to Derek, who's going to delve into more of the, the small business credit trend. All right, so uh, starting with an overview, a broad overview of the U.S. economy, what we can see is that, by all accounts, the U.S. economy is doing quite well, right? Output is up. We're growing uh, at a 2 to 2.5 percent uh, rate in terms of our gross domestic product, our GDP, and that's versus a 1.6 percent uh, growth, growth rate last year. So things have uh, sharply improved along that dimension. The labor market is particularly strong, and this is um, of most importance uh, to households who are the primary customers for many uh, small businesses, whether it's uh, small business retailers, restaurants, or other uh, suppliers of goods and services uh, to households. So studying the labor market and understanding what's going on uh, with employment is very, uh, key, very much key to understanding the health of, of uh, small businesses and their, and their future prospects. As we look at the, uh, the labor market data, what we can see is that the unemployment rate now stands at 4.3%. Uh, and that is below the 4.5% uh, level that we would consider uh, as a, a state of full employment, basically a situation where uh, everyone who uh, wants a job, is qualified for a job and, a, and willing to relocate for a job, is able to find a job with relative ease uh, in, in this type of a, a situation. Uh, there are broader measures of, uh, of, of unemployment, which would consider also those individuals who may be looked for a job for a while, but then stepped out of the labor market, right? So they, we would classify them as being only marginally attached uh, to the labor market. If you add in these additional uh, individuals and some other uh, individuals who, again, may not be actively looking for work, but 
presumably if the um, if the uh, labor market w were to improve, they would um, they would start to look for for work once again. You add these people back in, you get to uh, an underemployment rate of closer to 8.5%, uh, as you can see on the chart here, and that's still low uh, by historical standards. So we're at a, a point here where at these uh, levels of, of employment, employers are going to be under increasing pressure uh, to increase uh, wages, right? And that those increases in wages are going to lead to a higher demand for goods and services, and uh, this certainly will be of benefit to, uh, to small businesses. Now, that benefit, we believe, is going to offset some of the higher labor costs they will incur as they have to pay their own employees um, higher wages. Um, and that's uh, certainly some, something to consider. Uh, the other thing to, uh, to note is that if the labor shortages should persist or even increase, uh, this di dynamic could shift, right? If, they, if employers end up having to pay even more uh, or even higher wages, uh, than what they might receive from uh, in terms of higher uh, demand for their goods and services, that could that could be a real issue. And this certainly has some important implications as we think about immigration policies and how that um, and how that might be used, uh, or how might, how that might impact uh, the, the labor market itself. Okay. In addition to improvements in the uh, in the labor market, we also see that household finances. Are in, uh, are in good shape uh, overall. Uh, debt levels are back to up to their previous peak levels at around $13 trillion, as you can see in, in this uh, view here on, on, on slide eight. Uh, most of the increase in household credit has been in the form of auto loans, student loans, and now increasingly credit cards uh, since, the end, since the end of the Great Recession. Mortgage, mortgage lending has been relatively flat, although we can see a little bit of a, of a pickup uh, in the trend here as well. Now we might be concerned that uh, that this uh, return of debt to pre-crisis levels uh, is uh, setting up setting us up for some uh, some fall uh, later on or some weakness uh, in terms of households and the broader economy later on. But uh, one thing to consider is that what, that the numbers that we're looking at here are just representing the total amount of household debt outstanding. Once we control for population growth as well as inflation, what we can see on the, on the next uh, view here is that the uh, amount of debt per capita, the real amount of debt per capita, is actually still about 10% below what it was uh, just before the, the, uh, the Great Recession, between, before the uh, economic crisis. Uh, so from that perspective, right, uh, consumer balance sheets, consumer finances, look to be in, in, in fairly good shape in terms of, of, of those debt levels uh, relative to either their income or certainly uh, rel relative to their wealth or their, or, or their net worth. Now, more importantly from a debt sustainability standpoint is the uh, debt service ratio. So it's one thing to classify how much debt is actually being, um, uh, being held by consumers. It's something else to understand um, of the, the mechanics or the mechanism by which uh, households could pay their, their debts on a monthly basis. And so this debt service ratio that we see uh, shown here is at a, it remains at a, a very low level, very close to its uh, historic low. And this, uh, this uh, indicates that uh, households are spending only about 10% of their monthly incomes to service their debts, right? So, that, that leaves a lot of room on average uh, or for the average household to take on some additional debt if, if they so choose and certainly to keep uh, making payments on, on their existing debt obligations. So again, from this standpoint, not only are households benefiting from a, a stronger labor market and that's certainly starting to improve their incomes, their household finances, at least for the time being, by and large uh, remain in check. Now, that's not to say that there aren't pockets of risk or certain parts of the country, certain regions of the country where debt levels are particularly high uh, relative to the average, and, and so the uh, local economies may be weaker. But if we're just looking at this broad view, this, uh, this more global view of the U.S. economy, uh, households seem to be in pretty good shape when it comes to their, comes to their finances. And this improvement in both the labor market as well as finances has actually led to some increased optimism on the part of, of consumers. 
You can see on the on the chart here, if you look at data from the, the conference board illustrated by the purple line, that uh, consumer confidence is back up to levels uh, that we had prior to, to the recession. So we've, we've really come full circle in terms of the recession and the recovery. There is much more optimism on the part of uh, consumers, and I would attribute this largely to the improvements in the labor market, right? If consumers have jobs, if they are starting to see at least some uh, wage increases and anticipate some, some wage increases in the future, they uh, will and are uh, expressing increased confidence in the future economy. If we look at small business optimism as well, that's the uh, blue line with the left-hand side axis, you can see that uh, this optimism has also uh, recovered to, uh, to pre-recession levels. Actually, the, the most recent readings are above uh, the levels of optimism that we had back in, uh, back in 2006 before the country fell in, into, into recession. So small businesses in particular have expressed a lot of confidence given the promises for tax reform and less regulation that were made during uh, uh, last year's election. And you can see on the chart here that it was right around November when the, uh, when the confidence actually did start to spike up uh, for small businesses. And it remains uh, at that high level given, given the promises of, of the future. In addition, we have rising stock prices and low oil prices. And so those two factors as well should continue to support uh, confidence on both the consumer and the business side uh, for the foreseeable future. All right, in the short term, I want to uh, highlight just uh, two risks that we'll want to pay close attention to when it comes to the health of small businesses and their ability to continue to make uh, payments on their outstanding loans and, uh, and other uh, loan obligations. The first risk uh, to really focus on is, is that of interest rates. And interest rates have been low, they continue to be very low by historical standards, but they are projected to continue to increase as the economy keeps growing, right? As we get the additional output growth, as the labor market continues to tighten, uh, fears of inflation will continue to develop. There will be um, action that the Fed will want to take in order to stave off uh, a, a, a tremendous amount of inflation from increasing anytime soon. Now, at the moment, inflation remains quite subdued. So we, we are anticipating only one more uh, rate hike uh, later this year, as you can see on the slide here for the federal funds rate. But uh, we expect that the Fed will uh, start to hike rates more aggressively as we get into 2018 and 2019 as pr prices start to rise, right? So as wages are rising, as that cost structure uh, shifts, we do expect that uh, prices more broadly will rise and that the Fed will want to take some actions to start to cool off uh, the economy, keep it from, from overheating. Now, while we believe that these rate uh, increases should be manageable, right, so even as we are increasing these rates relatively rapidly in 2018, 2019, they are still low by historical standards, and that should uh, allow for some time for both businesses and consumers to adjust to this higher rate environment. There is a risk, though, that investors will get fearful and that the rates will spike up uh, unexpectedly. And if that occurs, right, certainly we could see some uh, slowing of growth uh, more broadly, and in particular we would put uh, small businesses at risk uh, for, for, uh, for uh, potential default. The, uh, the second risk that, we'd, um, that we would want to focus on is one around uh, tax reform, right? As I mentioned, a lot of confidence has been built up on the part of businesses under the expectation that there will be some reform uh, to taxes. And so a lot of the confidence is really uh, built into this assumption that we will get some type of uh, tax reform in the, in the near future. Now, some businesses that have even based their investment decisions on promises uh, to lower taxes. So if the tax reform that is expected doesn't come or is actually less beneficial uh, than expected, we could certainly see some type of a pullback in uh, investment plans, in expansion plans, and um, certainly more broadly uh, expectations of uh, some type of a slowdown in, uh, in the economic growth uh, or pace of economic growth uh, could be realized uh, as, as well, right? So if we're not seeing the, the, those tax reforms actually uh, bear fruit, a lot of this, uh, this confidence could be bought back, and uh, that could certainly slow things down uh, considerably. 
So this is uh, clearly something uh, we'll be watching. Congress is actively uh, in the middle of uh, debate of, um, of certainly uh, tax reform. It's a hot topic right now, something we are monitoring very closely, and I think anyone with an interest in, in small business, small business credit, will want to watch very carefully uh, what actually happens uh, in terms of changes uh, uh, to taxes going forward. For the moment, though, I think the optimism does remain. I think we can expect another quarter to uh, to continue, even if uh, the tax reform doesn't come immediately. Uh, if things get further stalled, that's when, again, we might see some of, some of the pullback that I mentioned. Okay, so with this as the backdrop, I'll uh, turn the floor over to Derek uh, to uh, walk us through some of the Main Street uh, small business report findings and, and outlook when it comes to small business credit. Derek? All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, I always like to start out by just saying I think that the the partnership that Moody's and Experian have formed to bring this small business report and publish it is very valuable and becoming more valuable with each iteration. Um, so what the report does is it brings data from about 7 million small businesses and how their credit is performing, brings them together and combines that with the economic data that we at Moody's provide. Um, and I think that this presents a wonderful value proposition. Um, so digging right into the small data or the small business data, um, looking at utilization rates, we've seen that in the second quarter uh, there was a little payback from the first quarter when we saw that utilization rates topped 42 percent uh, for the first time in about three quarters. Uh, but in the second quarter, utilization rates moved up to about 42.5 percent. We're seeing that more and more small businesses are drawing on their lines of credit and taking out new loans and looking to expand their businesses. Um, one place that we see this is in new SBA loans. Uh, so the SBA pr provides a provides a data set that is very reliable for how small business credit is growing. Um, and it's a nice way to uh, validate our results. So you see that in the SBA data, uh, new loan originations are up about 7% year over year as of August, which brings the total originations for the year over 23 billion. Um, looking in our own data, we see that originations are up approximately 8.4% year over year. So a slight difference, but they're close enough that it gives us confidence that we are capturing what's happening in the small business credit market. Getting into the performance side of things, we've seen that throughout our data history, um, performance has been improving, and in large part that's due to macroeconomic factors, which Chris was talking about previously. Um, so we've seen slow and steady growth for the last eight years or so, and that's resulted in small businesses being able to pay their credit on time and be able to manage their payments going back to the uh, sustainability that Chris talked about earlier. Um, so we've seen that right now small business credit is highly sustainable. Small businesses are managing their finances very well, and we're seeing that the credit in this area is performing very, very well at the moment. Um, so when we combine the increasing utilization, increasing originations, and improving performance, we see that small business credit right now is in a great place. So last year, for those of you who have followed this report, I was saying quite often that small businesses are sort of sitting on their hands waiting for something to happen before they make a move. And now we're seeing that small businesses are no longer sitting on their hands. They're starting to make their move. Um, and it's resulting in expansion and continued uh, excellent performance in the sector. One of the ways that our data uh, is really quite wonderful is it provides a great level of granularity. So as you can see here, we have 90, we have growth in 90 days past due balances. 
uh, in the second quarter by state. So we can compare at the regional or state level how small businesses are performing. And as you can see, uh, the upper plains in the second quarter had sort of a rough time of it. Um, part of that may have been due to continued weakness in commodity prices, especially stemming from oil. So as we um, are getting to a place where oil prices are stabilizing at a level below where they were a few years ago, uh, mining, small mining companies across the U.S. have shown some credit weakness, although that's started to reverse in the last couple of quarters. But we've then seen that weakness move into areas like transportation and manufacturing industries associated with mining. So the weakness didn't stay confined to one area. And although, as I said, the recovery is beginning, um, there is still there are still some wounds to heal in certain parts of the country. And this map, I think, illustrates that point very well. Um, looking to another region, the southeast, you can see that Georgia, South Carolina, and Alabama are all um, are all very very light blue, and they're really topping performance in the second quarter, along with uh, North Carolina, which performed very well. Uh, its performance in that state stayed about the same, but as you'll see on my next slide, um, the four states that I just mentioned, along with Michigan, are the top five performing states for small business credit at the moment. Um, and this is a pretty big change from what we saw at the same time last year when the top performers were a little more spread out between uh, a couple states in the Midwest, uh, a state in New England, and a state in the Plains. So we saw a lot of variation across the country in prior quarters as far as the top five uh, performing states go for these severe delinquencies. Um, but in the second quarter, we saw that, that the top performers really were clustered in the southeast of the United States. So we can also break out our data by industry, which is what you see here. Uh, displayed are nine of the industries that we have in our data. Um, and one of the industries I want to point out is construction. So construction has as you can see, been on a downward trajectory uh, throughout the history of our data. But in the second quarter, it moved from uh, being above 1% delinquencies to below, which is a fairly large move. And we'll probably see some payback for that in the third quarter, where uh, the rate will level, level out, because this, doesn't, this shift doesn't look quite sustainable, or it could even tick up just a little bit. Um, and one of the other industries that I want to highlight on this slide is what's going on in, in agriculture. So as I mentioned before, there's been weakness in commodity markets, and that hasn't been confined simply to oil and uh, other, other mineral uh, commodities. It's also affected those softer uh, food and agriculture-related commodities. Um, so the continued top performance among small ag companies is very interesting to see. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, farm incomes have fallen drastically, really quite dramatically. Um, but we haven't seen a large uptick in uh, delinquencies among credit in that industry. And based on where we are in the commodity price cycle, it's unlikely that we will see that. So it looks like um, ag's top performing status is uh, a stronger trend than at first uh, it looked to be, especially back in, say, 2016 Q3. Um, you can see an uptick there. But it looks like that trend is set to continue for the foreseeable future. Something a little more topical I wanted to touch on is what's happening with Hurricane Harvey. Um, so as I'm sure you're all aware, 
Hurricane Harvey devastated the Houston area, causing, by some estimates, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of damages. And quite a few people were evacuated and forced to flee um, what happened. So we're going to see, or we're likely to see, some payback in the Texas retail uh, industries, at least over the next quarter or so. Certainly there'll be some weakness in the third quarter, and it could continue into the fourth quarter depending on how quickly uh, money flows in to begin the process of repairing the damage that was done. So people are going to need to replace uh, damaged vehicles, damaged furniture, damaged homes, which all has the potential to impact small retailers in the Texas area, particularly Houston and the surrounding counties. Um, but over the last couple of years, we've seen that Texas retail has performed very well. Uh, it's the green line here. And particularly over the last year, it had fallen from rising delinquencies down to delinquencies below 0.6%. Um, and retail sales had been on an upward traje trajectory. Uh, but going into the third and possibly fourth quarters, as I said, we may see some payback stemming from people who weren't in the area to purchase goods and people who had closed their businesses to and prevent, which prevented them from selling goods. Um, so whether small businesses in the area have trouble paying their bills on time as a result of this is something that we're going to have to keep an eye on uh, going into the third quarter. Moving on to the Colorado mining industry, um, throughout the second half of 2016 and into the first half of 2017, we noticed that uh, the mining industry in Colorado was particularly hard hit for small business credit, rising from below 1% to two per, touching 2% in the first quarter. Uh, as you can see, from 2016 Q3 on, there was a very strong trend of, inc of rising delinquencies. Uh, but that was bound to reverse at some point. And the question is, is this industry done with its delinquencies now? Are we going to see a return to a more normal level and the, the band between 0.4 and 0.8% that you see dominating here? Or is there more weakness ahead for Colorado's mining industry. That's something else that we're going to be keeping an eye on and hopefully updating you on next quarter. And finally, um, I wanted to touch on something new that we've seen in our data. So as you've seen from the slides, our data goes back to 2015. Um, so we're working with a fairly new data set here. But in the second quarter, we noticed that we're starting to see what appear to be uh, what appears to be seasonality within the data. So as you can see, um, oh, the label is cut off a little here. What you're looking at is 90-day uh, delinquencies in Colorado's transportation industry. So what it looks like is happening is in the second quarter, uh, we're, we get a spike in delinquencies, which is then recovered in, in the third quarter and into the fourth quarter. Um, and this is an interesting time series trend, which now that our data set is getting longer and we have more history to, to look at, we can start to notice things like this that are going to happen on a, every, on a consistent basis every year. Um, so that's just something new within our data that I think is interesting to uh, know about and look at in the future. So hopefully we'll be bringing you more insights uh, like what we see here with Colorado transportation seasonality. Before I turn it over to Gavin, uh, one of the things we like to do is have polls so that we can hear what all of you are thinking about small business credit. Um, so right now we'd like to put up a poll asking, uh, over the next year, how do you think that your credit underwriting requirements for small businesses are going to change? Um, so if you want to take a few seconds and answer that, we can see uh, and get sort of a gauge of what you all are thinking, and you can all get a gauge of what other uh, loan officers are thinking about what's happening. Look 
looking like uh, consensus there, Derek, in that things are going to remain the same. Uh, things are looking like, yeah, 11% loosen, 9% tighten, 38% remain the same. Um, we had responses uh, just, to, just over half of the audience there. All right, well, hopefully if things are remaining the same over the next 12 months. That means that we are in store for some more strong origination growth and increase in credit performance as small businesses are managing their loans and only taking out what they can sustainably handle. Um, all right, well, thank you all, and I'll now turn it over to Gavin. Okay, Gavin, I'm gonna go ahead and pass control to you if you wanna unmute yourself there. Thank you, I'll Derek. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Derek. Well, welcome, everybody. We are now going to look at some additional data to understand at a more, more detailed, a more granular level uh, some, some of the nuances with the trends. So specifically, the question would be, are the overall positive trends mimicked in every sector, in every state? Are there exceptions? Is there anything there that we need to be looking at to, uh, to understand why it might be coming down the pike? So overall, the small business segment is in good shape. Credit performance is very positive. But what if we look into the data at a little, in a little bit more detail? So we went and analyzed several blocks of data from our small business credit share. This is a data consortium that contains somewhere around 50 million accounts with a lot of detail all related to small business. So that was our data set. We decided to look at uh, at a number of different subsets. Uh, the first comment I wanted to make is, you know, Derek said a little earlier that there are some potential negative impacts on retail in Texas are related to uh, the hurricane. So we thought we'd look at retail, particularly small retail, sales volumes up to 5 million to see um, within those segments across the U.S. were there any variations or deviations from that overall positive credit picture. When we looked at the data, we did a lot of analysis on it, and the conclusion is that the small retail segment is following very closely along the overall trends within small business. So then we said, well, okay, if that's the case, then, then what can we look at in more detail that might give us a little bit more insight and help us understand where there may be uh, some areas for concern down the pike? So when we look at our data, we look at it, or we looked at it broadly in these categories. We have defined the regions Midwest, Northwest, South, and so on. You can see the color coding there. So as we work our way through these slides, Think about this in terms of regions in the U.S. So our first one here we looked at was credit cards. So when we think about credit cards and we think about lines of credit and we think about small business loans, installment loans, they are very different products that are used differently depending on the life cycle stage of the small business. So for example, credit cards are particularly important because many of the micro businesses and very small businesses work from a credit card for the first several years, easy and ready access to credit, largely based on their personal credit score, personal uh, risk. So we took a look at credit cards in each of the regions and there are just a couple of comments that we can make on that. So the first thing is that we look at we looked at risk. So when we think about risk, we are using a score, a commercial credit score, 
that goes from zero to 100, and the higher the score, the better the credit, the lower the risk. So when we look in the credit card segment, the risk ranges from 62 to 66. So generally, the, these credit card portfolios in terms of risk of default and loss are in pretty good shape. The average balances, they range from $35 to $3,900. The highest charge-offs in terms of percentage of the overall portfolio we see in the southeast region. That's 0 0.65, which again is well within uh, normal ranges. The lowest we see is in the Midwest, and that's down at 0 0.46. So some definite variations across each of the regions. And again, this can relate back to some of the commentary earlier from Derek about commodities, mining, transportation, and so on. We then took a look at installment loans and asked the same question. What, are there any particular trends in each of the regions that we should be thinking about? We looked at it in terms of the risk scores, in terms of average balances, charge-offs, and delinquencies. And the interesting uh, conclusion from this slide was that in the Midwest, you've got a credit risk score of 57, which is well within the average range, slightly slightly uh, above average. We have balances of 127,000, but the percentage delinquency and percentage charge-offs are very low. So the Midwest in particular, in terms of installment loans for small businesses, seems to be performing very well. Now let's think about lines of credit. The balances in terms of lines of credit range from 87,000 average, and that's in the Midwest, down to 63,000 in the West. The risk band goes from 55 to 64, 55 in the Southwest, 64 in the Midwest. But there's one interesting, uh, particularly interesting number I wanted to highlight. And that's in the West region with a 3.8% charge-off rate, which seems pretty remarkable when we looked at some of the other products, meaning the loans and credit cards, and we looked at the other regions. So particularly in the West, that higher rate of charge-off in terms of lines of credit might indicate that in that region, uh, additional additional scrutiny and analysis could be warranted in terms of collections, in terms of uh, loss prevention. So we looked at each of the regions. Now let's take each of the products and look at them on four on four different variables in terms of balance charged off number of accounts charged off as a percentage, 91, 90 day plus, past due, number and dollars. And if we take if we take each in turn, there there's some kind of interesting conclusions. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that this range goes from uh, late 2015 all the way through Q2 of 2017. So if you take credit cards and look at the spike in terms of balance charged off, and that spike happened in Q4 of 2016. And then there was a significant drop off. And the, the comment I'd make about that is this, about 24 months ago, we observed a, within the small business credit card segment, an increase in volumes and a loosening or broadening of credit standards, not across the board, but with, with some of the larger small business credit card providers. 
So the credit standards were broadened, were loosened, balances increased, and then we saw some significant delinquency. And what we may have seen at the end of 2016 was a, a clearing out of some of those remaining severe delinquent accounts. The important observation is that the trends have now come together back to a more normal level with the one exception, which is 90 days past due in terms of balances continue to be high. Now again, that is, that is an indicator of potential trouble down the road. When we look at that spike in charge offs at the end of 2016, we could very well be, if, if those severe delinquencies are not managed appropriately, we could be looking at the same thing in the next six to 12 months. However, I want to point out one further thing, just a clarification. We are still talking about slightly less than 1% overall in terms of severe delinquency, which is within acceptable tolerances. If we look at the other two charts, installment loans, lines of credit, they are pretty much in alignment with all of the prior commentary, meaning they are, they are trending lower, they are generally stable, they are generally predictable. So again, the credit card is the, uh, is the product that requires perhaps a little bit more, uh, more scrutiny. We will be looking at the same data on credit cards next quarter, and it'll be interesting to see if we start to observe a, uh, an increase in the actual charge-off rate. Again, part of our goal with um, this analysis is to dig a little deeper and to, to, to validate some of the broader comments uh, from earlier on in the conversation, some of the more macro-level comments. So you can see very clearly, again, on this chart, that past due accounts number 90 days past due and balances 90 days past due are in pretty close alignment across the board. That trend, if we look at the trend in the south, southwest, west, indeed across the board, the trend is, is lower on balances and in a, uh, excuse me, it's low in terms of number of accounts, but in some areas there's a slight uptick in balances. Again, it supports the overall narrative related to the health of the small business credit sector. So a little earlier, Derek spoke about mining and transportation. We went in and dug a little bit deeper uh, the data here clearly supports that overall commentary. We see the spike in 2016 in terms of mining, and we see the trend coming back into line after that. On transportation, uh, the concern on transportation is that blue line from Q4 2016 through to date. The blue line is the percentage of accounts 90 plus days past due. The, the challenge is that while the percentage balances past due are lower, the fact that there is a significant number of accounts, relationships past due is a concern, even though it is dropping slightly. So again, this supports the overall narrative from earlier in the presentation. All right, so if you stand back and think about uh, demand, there's lots of data out there, lots of different reports, lots of different ways of looking at it. This is an interesting uh, illustration from the Federal Reserve. Now this relates to large and middle market company demand for loans, so not specifically related to small business, but I wanted to call your attention to the right-hand side, 
where you see from uh, 2010 pretty consistently through 2015 a pretty strong demand for loans, and then you see a drop off. The the key issue with that drop off is to understand why it happened, where it happened, what was what was it driven by, and is it is it going to be an enduring trend? Some of our thoughts on that. The we we are thinking that the demand from the perspective of banks is a little different than the overall demand in the space, meaning there's an increased volume of business going to alternative sources, going to uh, online providers. There's a proliferation of products in the space. So it'll be interesting to observe over the next several quarters what the, what the core demand will be from small businesses, specifically from the bank's perspective. One of the other interesting uh, data points we look at is the difference, the variation between uh, account openings and closings. Obviously, the interaction between those two points uh, give us a measure of portfolio runoff and the overall sustainability of the portfolio. None of the trends related to installment loan or line of credit are particularly remarkable. But we did observe on credit cards that in the first two quarters, there was a significant spike in credit card closures and account closures. Now, again, this is related, not, this has no connection to charge offs. Charged off accounts are excluded from, from this data. It's going to be interesting over the next several quarters to see whether that continues. The challenge there is if we continue to have a significant level of account closings versus openings, that's going to drive significant runoff in the portfolios, which again in turn could have an effect on what the credit standards are, potentially leading to broadening of the credit standards, potentially leading to uh, increased fees to support overall profitability. So we will be keeping a, a close eye on that data related to credit card account closures over the next several quarters. So in summary, the, the small business segment is in really good shape. Trends are generally positive. Within some regions, within some industries, there are some areas for concern. But the positive outlook continues. And with that, Gary, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Gavin. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you do have questions for the uh, panelists, um, you can submit them through the Q&A box. Now, we did get one question. Uh, I think I directed this one to either uh, Christian or Derek uh, regarding um, the, the economy. There was a question here that came in, markets and forecasts turn a blind eye from high political tensions in North Korea, multiple natural disasters, hurricanes. And uh, how do you reconcile the high rosy forecast GDP, 2.5%, with the negative and observed realities? Difficult, yeah. one, tough question. Yeah, yeah it's a, that's a great question. And I, I appreciate the, uh, the healthy skepticism, right? There's a lot of, uh, there are certainly a lot of negative um, uh, events having weight on, on the economy as well. I guess the way I, I I reconcile these differences really between a little bit between the media focus and the hard data, right? So I think the media does certainly focus on some of these uh, issues of uh, geopolitics and natural disasters, and obviously what's going on in Washington. Uh, but when we look at the actual data, uh, we see that the, the picture isn't quite as uh, as bleak as what we might highlight in those stories, right? So. If we look at the consumer data, right, we, we saw some of that in, in, in the slides here, but uh, spending remains quite robust. So consumers are not uh, really shaken by these uh, political uh, tensions or the geopolitics, at least not yet, all right? So retail sales are up 4% on a year-over-year -year basis. 
the labor market, as I, as I mentioned, is also uh, showing improvement. So those are hard numbers, right? We're, we're adding 175,000 uh, jobs per month uh, to payrolls. If we look at the data from ADP, uh, we see that small businesses have been adding about 50,000 of those jobs every month uh, through, throughout uh, 2017, actually uh, starting in 2016 as well. Uh, we have 6.2 million job openings uh, at the moment. So employers also not particularly shaken uh, by some of those political events uh, that, that are out there, right? That's not to say that they won't be in the future, but at least so far we haven't seen any uh, real lack of confidence uh, in, light of these, uh, in light of these concerns. So I, I think, um, you know, in terms of the specifics here, in terms of political tensions or the geopolitical tensions, right, uh, again, I think the, the North Korea situation is, is absolutely uh, uh, something on the, on the mind of a lot of consumers and businesses, but yet it has not yet uh, in, influenced their, their behavior. And the natural disasters, obviously, that will have an impact on uh, GDP growth, particularly in Q3 here. We are pulling in our, our, our forecasts uh, for, for activity in this quarter, but typically uh, natural disaster uh, will uh, certainly impact wealth, right? So wealth is, is certainly impacted immediately by the destruction of, of, of a property there. But as insurance payments come in and as uh, federal aid and other aid comes in and uh, the, those cities start to rebuild, what you typically see is that GDP actually starts to grow and uh, you can see some acceleration in the following quarters. So we will see a reduction in our Q3 forecast, but actually we'll put back uh, some of that uh, forecast, put some of that loss into Q4, and that keeps our overall uh, forecast for, for 2017 uh, fairly high in, the, in that two and a quarter, two and a half percent uh, range. And finally, on the dysfunctional government, I think that uh, you know that's that's nothing really new. So uh, consumers, businesses, they they're kind of grown accustomed to that dysfunctional government, and they're optimistic in the sense that the, you know, there is a chance that something positive could come out, uh, could be uh, uh, delivered in the way of uh, Im improved taxes or tax reform and a lighter touch on, on some regulation. I think that's the, the real boost in confidence, but I don't know that if we don't get that uh, type of reform immediately or very soon, it's going to erode that confidence uh, tremendously relative to all these other positive factors around labor market and uh, consumption that I mentioned. Okay, excellent. There, there was one other question that came in from Kevin um, regarding uh, small business markets and how they differ, uh, like markets like Hawaii uh, to their national performance. What are the trends telling us about those markets? I, I, would, I would probably urge Kevin to uh, check out our interactive business information map. We do show uh, industry level uh, stats uh, are by region, by state, by metro, uh, and you can find that. Uh, I'll actually include a link to that in our follow up email. But I'm wondering if are there any comments on uh, regional trends in, in some of these uh, smaller markets like Hawaii? Hi, Gary, it's Kevin. Um, we have we've done a lot of studies uh, for clients that are based on individual markets or states and industries. There is, um, if, if we take Hawaii for, exa for an example, um, one comment I can make is that we've done several studies and Hawaii is definitively a place unto itself. There are, there are significant differences in terms of the industry compositions, the size, the cost, the expenses, you know, the structural kind of uh, issues related to the islands. Uh, so, so we have definitely seen Hawaii as, as, as different to uh, the main U.S. states. When we look at the regional map, the colored map we put up earlier, we pick those regions based on the data we see on each of the states levels, state levels, and they tend to, they tend to go well together. There tends to be a lot of of commonality in terms of, uh, again, environment, structure, and so on and so forth. So lots of variations, but it depends on the specific context. And again, I think your recommendation to go to the uh, interactive map is, is a good one. Okay. There was one question, I posed this to Derek about agriculture, to, and this comes from Mike. 
To what extent do you think agriculture's superior performance can be attributed to the availability of government subsidies? Sorry, I was on uh, I was on mute there. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, it's a great question, Mike. Um, it's a little tough to tell from our data, but I, I don't think it plays a tremendous role in agriculture's performance. Um, just given given how sustained the trends in its performance are, um, it seems in at least to me, it strikes me as something more in the mentality of farmers and how they manage their finances. Um, there could be some some effect from subsidies, but in my mind, it would be uh, it would be minor. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, I'm afraid we're going to probably have to leave it there. We've only got a few minutes left. If you do have questions, uh, just submit them to us in the Q&A while we're here. We'll try and follow up with you one-on-one. -on -one. We'd like to thank everyone for attending today's session. Thanks to Derek and Christian from Moody's Analytics and to Gavin, of course, from uh, Experian. If you would like more information on Moody's Analytics, you can go to moodysanalytics.com. And for more information on Experian's business information, products, and services, you go to experian.com slash B2B. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending today's quarterly business credit review. We'll see you next time.